Amen. Hallelujah. It's amazing what different ones has gone through in this life. And uh, it's, a, it's a building of strength when you testify about it. It strengthens you whenever you testify about it. A lot of people don't want to admit or don't want to talk about things that maybe hurt them or things that confused them or caused them trouble. Or, But whenever you, when you testify of it, basically what you're doing is you're owning it. Amen. And you're giving praise and honor to God for bringing you through it. Amen. The devil can't use it against you. Amen. And uh, that's part of maturity. Amen. That's part of being mature. As we are young and a lot of things, a lot of life ahead of us, we don't pay attention to things like we maybe should. We don't take, we take for granted a lot of things that we shouldn't. The older we get, the things, you know, begin to change and we begin to see things and begin to understand things and we see through uh, the surface of it we see to the depth of it you know the older we get the more we are able to take uh, you know take stock into what it means and what it you know to what it you know should mean to us and this is a sign of mature and it's a sign of getting older uh, and understanding things that uh that uh that we need to understand and I said that to say this uh, thinking about this service tonight and uh, on Wednesday night, we've been dealing with, you know, maturity. Uh, God don't want us to be a church of immature Christians. And whenever you begin to talk about maturity, Paul used the word perfection several times. And that word perfection was not a without fail, like we think of that word. But it meant that it was a maturity, a maturation process, a process of failing but learning from my failure and then doing better the next time. When people say, well, Brother Chris, I'm not perfect. I understand we're not perfect. But I don't expect to do the same things over and over again. At some point, if I'm going to mature and grow in my relationship with the Lord, then I've got to learn I can't keep making the same mistakes. If I keep making the same mistakes, then I'm not learning anything. I'm allowing that to defeat me, and the reason it's defeating me is because my faith in God is something's wrong in my relationship. So what we want to begin to understand is, you know, as we're a church fitting to be five years in the undertaking, that's not very old compared to a lot of the churches around here. We've had some that celebrated their 100th year and maybe some longer than that. But I guarantee you, you won't find a church where the people have come together any quicker than this group has and love the Lord anymore. Now, I'm not saying that there's not those that don't love him, but I'm saying you won't find one no better. I don't believe you will. Where the people are genuine to the fact that they love God with all their heart. Great churches in this community. I've had the privilege of preaching in a lot of them and fellowship with a lot of the pastors and the laity. And they some good churches in this community, but I don't think you can find a better one, amen, where people come together, amen, and love one another and want the best for each other, amen, and have put aside whatever differences may be, political, socioeconomic, poor, rich, short, tall, skinny, black, white, it doesn't matter. It's simply about Christ and Him crucified. I have a desire to go to home, to heaven, when this life is over. And I expect the men and women that come through that door, amen, to have that same desire. And I prayed that whenever, God, when we open these doors and we begin to have service, if there'd be anything contrary to that, Lord, I pray reveal it to the heart. Reveal it to that person's heart, amen, that we're not here, amen, to be seen or to be heard, but we're here to lift up the Lord Jesus Christ. We're here, amen, to have church, amen, and to... And to grow in the Lord and to do better than we did yesterday. Not that I, I have a desire to be perfect so I can use that over other people and I can say, look at me. But I have a desire to be like Him. And He is perfect. Amen. And therefore, I desire, amen, to gravitate, amen, to be like Him. So when we begin to talk about maturity, what we have to measure ourselves by is, am I doing better 
than I was yesterday. Now, that word better is like, do I want to give myself a grade? I'm not talking about giving ourselves an A or a B or a C or a D. But what I'm saying is, is in the, that word better, am I doing that which God would have me to do? Is my heart set to please the Lord with my life? When I get up, what is it that's on my heart? What is it that I think of first? Do I have my priorities in order? Am I thinking about heaven? Am I like John saying, Lord, quickly, or Lord Jesus, come quickly? You know, am I looking to him, amen, for my help that day? Or is my mind somewhere else already at the breaking of day? When the, through the course of the day, do I look to him? Do I seek him? Do I pray, amen, Lord Jesus, help me and help my fellow man, help my enemies, Help those that despitefully use me. Lord, I, I pray that you bless them. I, I, Lord, you know my heart. You know it's hard for me. Uh, uh, that person's done me wicked. That person's done me harm. That person has not been my friend. That person has persecuted me. But, God, I don't want nobody to die lost, and I don't want nobody to go to hell. And, God, I pray change my heart, amen, that I can love people in such a way, amen, that it will supersede, amen, anything that's been done between me and them. Is this the attitude that we're living with daily? And whenever we begin to think about this, the, what we begin to understand is that in order to mature, we have to grow. There, there, maturation is a growing process. And the fruit, amen, that abounds in the account of a born-again believer, amen. I, 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 you know, if you plant an apple seed, you're not going to get an apple tomorrow. Amen. If you plant an orange, you're not going to get an orange tomorrow. It's going to take time. But there's one seed, amen, or there's one thing that when it's planted, amen, and whenever it comes to fruition, it immediately brings forth a small amount of fruit, and it grows rapidly. And that is at the point of salvation. Amen. When a person, amen, accepts Jesus Christ immediately, that person begins to produce fruit if he or she, amen, has accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And it's in the opposition, amen, the young converts, I tell them, whether they're young or old, they're new converts, they say, well, Brother Chris, I want to know that I know. How do I know? Is Are the devil coming after you? Are you having trouble? Amen. Do you realize it's wrong to do some of those things you were doing? And you're battling, amen, the desire to want to do it versus I want to not do it to please God. Amen. That's a sign right there that something has changed in your heart because the day before you didn't care, you just done it. But now that the Spirit lives in, that's fruit, amen. It may not look like an apple tree. It may not look like it's hanging like the grapes, amen, uh, in the vineyards of, uh, of Canaan, amen. Uh, but I promise you, amen, in the eyes of God, He sees fruit, amen, that's abounding to your account. Why? Because you're looking to Him, amen. You may struggle and you may fail. You may do something, amen. You say, God, forgive me. I don't want to do it. Strengthen me, help me, encourage me, lift me up. And I want to keep on. And, and the, the more we begin to seek Him and put our trust in Him and faith in Him, the more fruit we begin to grow in our life. And I believe it's, it, it is seen immediately. Those that are closest to you may not admit a lot of times we hear this, you ain't never going to change. That something has changed in you prompted them to say, you ain't never going to change. In other words, they seen something different. They seen something that's different. But what they want to do is the enemy wants to use them to try to snub that out. So they say, you ain't never going to keep this up. It's really what they're saying. I see something different in you, and I wish I could be like you. I wish I could be bold. I wish I could make that same decision. I wish I could get out of this hell hole that I'm living in. I wish I could turn my life around like you have. You ain't never going to keep that up. That's what they say. But on the inside, I wish I could do like you're doing. But the devil ain't going to let them do that. But if you go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter number 9, amen. As we continue talking about growing in the Lord, I believe last Wednesday night, amen, we talked about patience. And James told us to count it all of joy, amen, when we enter in or when we fall into divers' temptations. For knowing this, that the trial of our faith worketh patience. 
And we understand that patience, amen, is a virtue. <laughs> amen. But really what patience does is it gives us an opportunity to allow God to work. And without patience, amen, we're not going, we're going to rush. We're going to, we're going to do things, amen, before God's time, amen. So that's why James said our faith, amen, we understand everything is predicated on faith. Peter, or Paul said it this way, for by grace are you saved through what? Now, we understand grace is there. Grace is right there. But it does not abound on somebody's account. It does not cover somebody until they activate faith. For by grace are you saved through faith. That word through is you putting faith in grace and allowing it to cover you and to cleanse you. Amen. In other words, I'm saved because I believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's it. Amen. There's nothing else that has to be done there. Amen. I believe, amen, in the Lord Jesus Christ. I trust Him as Lord and Savior of my life. Amen. And that right there is the transaction. Amen. That's me handing over and Him handing it back to me. Amen. And grace covering me. Amen. And the blood washing me clean. So we see here as, now as we grow, it's activated by faith. Our relationship ensues. Amen. So when our faith is tested, it bringeth forth patience. So we understand patience is needed in order, amen, for to allow God time to work. Why? Because God don't work on our time. Amen. So whenever we're maturing, amen, you plant that seed, what do you have to do? You have to wait. <laughs> amen. You have to be patient. I don't care how much you want an apple. You're not going to get it until it's time. Amen. It's not coming just because you want it. That's the difference between, amen, Christianity being born again. I'm going to read this in a minute, but I just, I'm just following the Lord. That's the difference, amen, between being born again, amen, and a person, amen, claiming a relationship through head knowledge. One is a microwave salvation, and the other one, amen, is the, patient of, is the patience of God. What I'm saying is, is the person, amen, who makes the Lord Jesus Christ Savior of his or her life, amen, is changed, amen, and they're no longer governed by themselves, amen. They have given themselves over to Jesus Christ, amen, and they say, Lord, whatsoever thy will, do with me, amen. Uh, and then, amen, we patiently wait, amen. Uh, uh, we may be doing something daily, uh, but we're patient in, with the Lord so that he can work in our life. The person that, amen, has a head knowledge or the person that, amen, comes to church and is reluctant to give his or her heart to the Lord, but yet they want to be religious because they like what religion brings. They like dressing in a three-piece suit. They like the newest style clothes. They like being seen at the church. They like the way people treat them at the church. They like the songs that they sing. They like the preacher that's there. There's a lot of reasons why people go to church besides Jesus Christ. And this person, amen, over a period of time begins to identify as a Christian because he or she is going to church, amen. Uh, and people begin to look at them and say, well, you must be a Christian. You've been coming here for six months or a year. You're still here. You must be a Christian, amen. But there's no discernment there to see what's in that person's heart. So now, this is what I call a microwave religion. Everything they want it, they want it now. But the person that's born again is willing to wait on the Lord. Amen. The person, amen, who has a head knowledge, and you can see it throughout church history. You can see people, amen, who, who uh, are rushed into things, uh, did not seek the Lord, did not uh, 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 cover things with prayer, did not season, amen, the services, amen, did not allow God time to work in a person's heart, amen. Uh, we rush people, amen. Uh, the person walks in the door, and within two weeks we want to make them deacon, uh, or we want to make them the lead head singer, amen, or the number one musician, uh, amen. We don't let, let God take time, amen, uh, to work in that person's life, amen, and to do something with them. Yes, we won't encourage people, uh, but we've got to let God do what God does. But in this modern society, amen, they, you come in one week and they give you the visitor's card. The next week you come in, you know, they, they make you 
be over the children's church the next week, you know, and you well, you play piano? Yeah, well, come on. You know. I, hey, I'll let somebody play piano because we need a piano player. But I promise you, I ain't going to let that person come back and play that piano. Now, this is FYI for our congregation. If I don't know that person, please don't tell them to go up there and play the piano. Because anybody that comes up here, I want to try to have some semblance of them doing and living right. I don't say that to be mean to your brother, your sister, your daughter, whoever. I'm simply saying, when we use people in the ministry, we want to try to be doing the right thing. Amen. If I know this person and they can play, yeah, come on up. A preacher. Don't send no preacher up here because I'm going to have to tell him to sit down. And I don't want to hurt nobody's feelings. You say, Brother Chris, you awful being awful tough, being awful mean. This right here is protected. And this is my area right here. And when he made me the shepherd over this area or over this, I don't want nothing up here that's going to damage what God's trying to do. I don't know everything. I don't know everybody. But if the Lord speaks to me it ain't right, I'm going to say something. I expect you to say something. I expect this. Why? Because that's a level of maturity. Amen. That we've gotten to. I don't have to hurt nobody's feelings. You don't have to hurt nobody. You don't have to be mean to nobody. It may be we let the person play and then we talk to them afterward and say, Look, I want to ask you a few questions. I want to talk to you about your relationship with the Lord. And if it don't go the way it ought to go, I mean, if this person can't give an account of his or her, you know, life and what Christ has done, then we may have to make a statement right there. Hey, you know, you need to keep coming, but I want you to listen to the Word of God. I want you to be in the service. I want you to experience what God's done. And, and let's grow in the Lord or let's get saved. And I know a lot of people, they, they want to be a part of what's going on at the church. The level of maturity that I want us to get to is this. If a person walks in that door, we want to love them. We've got to love them. Born again, lost and undone, white, black, man, woman, boy, or girl, it doesn't matter. We've got to love them. Don't allow our zealousness to try to impress somebody or to make them feel so a part of it that we rush them into something that they don't need to be in. Let's be mature, amen, in what God's doing in our lives. What does that mean? That means there's steps, amen, that must be taken, amen, in this Christian life. We don't go, amen, from the outhouse all the way to the White House, so to speak, amen. In other words, there's things that has to be learned. There's things that have to be gone through. And what I've seen in this church is we've seen people come in and we've loved them and we've cared for them and we've nurtured them, amen, and we've seen them grow, amen. I've seen some of you blossom, amen, and really begin to come out. And, and it's a beautiful thing, amen, but I did not try to rush you into something that you was not ready for. I, I could not make you this, that, or the other, amen, uh, until, amen, there was fruit, amen, not just for me. Amen. But that you could begin to see fruit in your life. Amen. You can begin to see God working in your life. And oh, does that not give you confidence when you see God begin to work in your life? Not only does my pastor see it, not only does my neighbor see it, but I see it. Amen. I see where God's doing something. I, I can trust the Lord. Amen. I do love Him with all my heart. Amen. He is blessing me. Amen. He is doing something in my life. And it's beautiful. And I can see it. Amen. That is maturity. Amen. That's coming up. And we, we, we understand this because, amen, we can't rush people into things. We have to let God have his time. And in this scripture in 1 Corinthians chapter number 9, in verse number 24, Paul said, Know you not that they which run in a race run all? But one receives the prize. So run that you may obtain. And as we begin to look here, he says in verse 25, And every man that striveth for the mastery is what? Temperate in all things. Temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible crown. There's a difference in what the world's working for 
and what we're doing. There's a difference. Amen. He says, so I therefore so run. Or what he's saying is, this is the reason why I run. Not as uncertainly. He says, so fight I. Or he says, this is why I fight. Not as one that beateth in the air. He says, but I keep under my body. And I bring it into subjection. Lest that by any means when I have preached to others, I myself should be a castaway. Dear Heavenly Father, help us this night, Lord, as we look to you. Father, strengthen us, encourage us, bless us with your word tonight. And Father, as we try to teach, Father, this that you've laid upon our hearts, I pray, Lord, you'd open every ear. And Father, that you'd allow, Father, and open the hearts tonight to let us say the Lord. Father, encourage us, lift us up, bless us. Father, let us strengthen us tonight. Father, let us grow tonight in you. Fathers, we look to you, the author and the finish of our faith tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. When we're talking about maturity and talking about growing in the Lord, one of the things that seems to be such a, a, a hindrance in churches is the idea that if I'm not being seen or if I'm not being heard or if my will, my way is not being done, if I'm not the one that gets to make the decision on the color carpet or if I'm not the one that gets to make the decision on how are we going to redo the social hall or if, if I'm not in the decision-making process or if I don't have my hand on the button of what's going on, then I'm not being a vital part of my church. And what seems to happen a lot of times is people, because of immaturity or because uh, maturity may be in the ways of the world, but not maturity in the ways of the Spirit. See, he said, I'm temperate in all things. The person that, amen, that's trying to strive for the mastery is temperate in all things. He says, but they do it to obtain a corruptible crown. We do it to obtain an incorruptible crown. Now, this is where I'm going with this because this is what we have to look at. When we look at our heart, we look at our life and how we're living for the Lord, it's very much important, amen, that we remember Amen. Whatever happens, amen, heaven is our goal. Amen. Whatever the government does, that's them, heaven's my goal. Whatever Russia does, heaven's my goal. Whatever the school board does, heaven's my goal. Whatever Harvey's does for sale on Wednesdays, they didn't have my pork chops like I wanted, so be it, amen. Heaven's my goal. I'm not losing, amen, my integrity with God over what's happening in this world. I'm striving for the mastery, amen. I'm striving for heaven, amen. That word mastery describes, amen, Jesus Christ. He is the master, amen, of, amen, this salvation, amen. He created it, amen, this heaven and earth. And when he hung on the cross, amen, he gave us the truth, the way, the truth, and the life, amen. So he is what we're striving for, amen. Uh, and Paul said in order, amen, to obtain that mastery or to master the craft in which we're running, amen, this race, uh, amen, we must be temperate in all things, amen, and to be temperate, amen, that word temperate there, it means, amen, to not allow oneself, uh, amen, to get out, amen, uh, 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 of the uh, the desire or the goal, amen, uh, I must, amen, confine myself to what the goal is uh, and stay within, amen, what's necessary to do or to obtain, amen. In other words, if I'm striving to be Christ-like, amen, I can't be found, amen, on Friday night at the football game cussing out the referee. Amen. I don't care how much you love, amen, Berrien County, amen. It's not worth it, amen. I don't care how much you hate Brooks County. That game's coming up, amen. And we're going to sit in the stands on that night, amen. I'm going to be there, and I'm going to hear some of Berrien County's finest, amen, uh, that go to some of Berrien County's biggest churches, amen, sitting right behind me cussing every other play, amen, because their child didn't get the right call. Now, that is a shame. That's a shame. See, we're striving for an incorruptible crown. Amen. We're in a race, amen. That race is life, amen. And in this race, there are many obstacles. There's many things to try to trip us up, amen. The devil knows your weaknesses uh, better than you do, and he knows how, amen, to lay those traps, uh, and he's doing it on purpose, amen. Uh, but Christ says, amen, uh, that we are to keep ourselves tempered, amen. The Holy Ghost moved on Paul uh, to say if, amen, uh, there's a race to be run, uh, the only way to win that race is to do what? Everybody's got to run. 
You can't win the race if you don't get in the race. All right, now that you're in the race, you're born again. Amen. He says, now you have to understand. Amen. In this race, amen, there's obstacles, amen. It's going to not be an easy race. It's going to be a hard race. Uh, so you've got to temper it yourself, amen. Paul said when these men began to run these races, uh, they trained, amen. Uh, they went through things, amen, that was harder than the race, amen, in order when the time come to run, it would be easier. They conditioned themselves. They worked at their craft. Now, we understand we only get one life to live. We only get one opportunity to run this race. You don't get a chance to make a mistake, amen, and die and come back and do it again and say, God, I, I, I want to take a mulligan on that one. There are no mulligans on this one. For those who don't know what a mulligan is, you've never played golf before. When you go on the first tee box and you hit that first shot and it goes right over yonder in the water, you say, that was my practice shot. Now, this is my real one. And then you want to count that as number one, not that one. That's a mulligan. You don't get to do that. In the sense that if you, if you live this life in, in a fashion that's not becoming the Lord and die, it's over. That's it. We know this. So what are we trying to learn tonight? All right, now, I'm in this race, and I want to temper it myself. Amen. In other words, I'm training by coming to church. I'm training, I'm, I'm, I'm honing my craft, amen. I'm getting stronger, amen. I, I, in other words, when I temper it myself, uh, I'm not allowing myself to do things uh, that's not going to benefit me in obtaining, amen, that incorruptible crown, amen. I don't want to waste any time, amen, doing anything, amen, that's not uplifting or building the kingdom of God. Why? Because if I'm spending my time doing something that's not glorifying God, amen, then I am, amen, taking time away way from getting better or getting closer to him i'm allowing i'm, I'm not being temperate I, and i, I want to get this word home and i want us to have a good understanding when we leave here of what this means how many of you want to go to heaven i hope we all raise both hands amen in other words we want to go to heaven when this life is over and Paul tells us here, amen, that there's an incorruptible crown, amen. Uh, in other words, it is that which God has prepared for them that love him, amen. Uh, this is not, amen, a trip to IHOP, amen, in Disney World, uh, amen, but it's talking about heaven, amen. Uh, it's talking about eternity, amen. Uh, not two weeks in paradise, amen, in Hawaii, yeah, but an eternity, amen, where a thousand days is as one day, amen. And when 10,000 times 10,000 years has passed, amen, it all has been as just the first day, amen. If a sparrow was to take every grain of sand uh, from every beach on this planet uh, and moved it out into the middle of nowhere, uh, he would not even have begun the first second, amen, uh, in eternity. That's what we're talking about going to and spending that eternity, that never ending, no end to it in sight, in heaven with the Lord Jesus Christ. And the reason that we can have this hope is because he came and he bled and he died. And then we turned to him and by faith we believed in him and the grace of God came upon us and the blood washed us and cleaned us. So now that I'm in this race, let's look at what he said. Know you not they which run in a race run all. Why? Because they want to receive the prize. I want to receive the prize. I don't know about you. I'm not talking about a gold medal, but I'm talking about, amen, life everlasting. Amen. I'm not even interested in the crown. Amen. That we will receive, amen, the soul winner's crown. Amen. The believer's crown. Amen. The many different crowns that will be there. Amen. Or be awarded. Amen. Uh, but the Bible says that we will lay those crowns uh, at Jesus' feet. Amen. Uh, I believe there will be a mountain of crowns in front of him. Amen. Because those that make it to the celestial city. Amen. Simply want to be there. Amen. Because he's there. Amen. Uh, I've got no other desire for heaven. Amen. Uh, I know I've got loved ones over there. But can I tell you something? Uh, when they lay me down to rest. Amen. And I take my final breath. Uh, it's not going to be my mom, dad, aunts, uncles, brothers, sisters, children, nobody else that I want to see, amen. It's going to be Jesus, amen. But the benefit, amen, the dividend is that my family, I pray to God, will be there. And those I love. And you and those who's gone on before. Amen. I'm glad tonight that there'll be no recognition of those that are not there. 
How could heaven be heaven? Amen. If you knew that there was somebody that was not there. Amen. You'll not have any recognition of those who are not. Only known those who are. Amen. God has made it that way. So we know that they all run to obtain a prize. And he likens us running this race of life. He says we're running this race and we too want to obtain the prize. Amen. But there's a difference. Amen. He says every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. In other words, in order for those runners to win a race, they had, amen, to prepare themselves. And to be temperate, amen, is a preparation. Amen. It is not allowing the body. It's not allowing oneself, amen, whether it be, amen, mental, physical, or whether it be spiritual, amen, the opportunity, amen, to go outside of that which is necessary to obtain to be tempered, amen, means to have a desire to want something, amen, and then to pay the price in order to get it, amen. Uh, when I was a child and you was a child, uh, most of us, amen, had to work, amen, if we wanted something, amen. I may not have to come up with the, all the money, uh, but dad, mom and dad wanted to make sure that I had some investment in whatever it was that I wanted. Why? Anybody tell me why? Because anytime you put money into it, it's going to mean more to you. The first time I bought my truck, I didn't pay a dime for those tires. I helped pay the insurance. I helped pay the payment. But I squalled them tires till they wasn't nothing but tri they wasn't nothing but steel left on them. And that next set of tires, Daddy says, you're going to buy two of them. And I'm going to make sure that Rudy puts them on the back. And he said, I'm going to have my name written on the front too. And your name's going to be written on the back too. And he said, then I want to see you squall them down. He says, because when they gone... I'm going to put mine on the back, and you're going to have to buy two more. It meant something whenever I had an investment in it. So I had to temper it myself. What did that mean? That meant I was a bus boy, or I, I worked at the grocery store. Amen. And I had, amen, to amen, strive to do my job. I had to temper it myself to do my schoolwork and to perform my job duties. I had to make sure that I spent my money wisely because I had to have some money to go to this, some money had to go to that, some money for the weekend. In other words, I was temperate, amen, and the only way to succeed, amen, was to make sure, amen, that I lined everything up, amen, and I did things the right way in order to be successful or to have it. Didn't mean I had to make a million dollars. We're not talking about maybe $100 here. But it was, to me, it was a lot. And it was an investment that caused me to begin to respect, amen, the vehicle that I had. It lasted me quite a while. Some of my friends that moms and dads bought their vehicles didn't last so long. One of my buddies ran his off in Forest Lakes. Just didn't care. Brand new truck, Z71. Didn't mean much to him. Daddy went and bought him another one. I didn't have that luxury. <laughs> Amen. I think I had them tires on there when I got rid of that truck. <laughs> so every man that striveth for the mastery is tempered in all things. What are you? Amen. In order for you to run this race, in order for you to finish this race and to hear Christ say, well done, what is it that you have to do? What is it that you have to bring into subjection? Because that's the next word that he used. Now, we're talking about maturity here. So we're talking about getting out of the things, amen, that cause us trouble. One thing that causes us trouble, amen, uh, in the spiritual is whenever we allow ourselves, amen, uh, to, to promote others or to do things for others, amen, uh, uh, before God's ready. What are you saying? In the natural world, Amen. We're bosses. We're supervisors. We've worked jobs for 20, 30 years. We see potential in somebody. Amen. How many ever seen a young man or a young woman have potential and you wanted to try to get them up into another job or get them a better way to help them out? Amen. And they succeeded in it. Amen. And then they had a good career in it. You saw that potential in them. See, we can see potential in Christians. Amen. 
we can see a young man, a young woman, a beautiful family, amen. And, boy, we can picture him being a, a on-fire evangelist for God, amen. And the next thing you know, we can be pushing him in that direction, amen. But that don't mean that God is. So what we see as Christians in the spiritual, amen, we have to be careful what we do and how we push and how we promote. Why? Because if God's not in it, it's not right. In other words, we have to allow God to work in that young family's life. And then we will see them blossom, and we will see them be what God wants them to be. So that's one way that we are not temperate in the kingdom of God. Another way we're not temperate in the things of God, amen, and I don't want to make this a, a, a bad message, but I, I want us to hit some points here. Another way that we're allowed ourselves to get out of the will of God is whenever we want to promote what we want to be done. Whenever it's how I want it to be done. Well, I, I want red carpet. And, and then whenever we do that, and the church votes to go with blue carpet, and this person gets mad and leaves the church because they didn't go with red carpet, this person cannot tell me that they're striving for the mastery, amen, for an incorruptible crown. Something is wrong in this relationship. Something is wrong, amen, with this person, amen, with them kneeling down before God and, and loving God with all their heart, amen, and loving their fellow man, amen, as God so loved them, amen. How can we agree, amen? He said, how can you love God whom you haven't seen when you can't love your brother who you have seen? That's one way we get outside of the temperance. Temperance is to bring this everything, emotions, our spiritual, mental, physical in other words it's not just i'm spiritual and i love god spiritually and then physically i'm living in the world doing what i want to do everything is working together why because i want to obtain an incorruptible crown and i can't allow any part of me amen to be outside amen of trying to achieve and obtain this goal now when we say obtain or achieve we understand that there's a misconception I thought about this on the way to work this morning. We have a denominational belief, a strong denomination in this part of the world. Amen. If I get saved, that's all I have to do. God will do everything else for me. All I have to do is commit to Him or say yes to Him, and then God's going to handle it from there. And there, there's a strong Amen. Belief system in this community and in this part of, of the South, amen, that believes this way. They're taught this way. They grow up this way. That as soon as I give my heart and life to Christ and I get baptized, amen, I'm in. And now all I have to do is just wait till he comes. And what I do in the meantime is going to be overlooked or forgiven because I accepted him as Lord and Savior. That's a strong belief. Now, you don't hear it like that, but you see it in the lives. A lot of them sit behind me at the football game. And they almost spit on me every time they holler and they yell. And when I turn and look at them, oh, Brother Chris, I'm sorry, I shouldn't have said that in front of you. God forgive me. I, son, he ain't heard that. I promise you, he ain't heard that. I shouldn't, I, I shouldn't. But that, oh, that gets me. That gets me. That's people trying to use their liberty for a cloak of mischievousness. I mean, they're, they're, they're doing things that they know is wrong, but yet an experience they had with God a year ago, 10 years, whatever, is going to cover that. No, you better ask forgiveness. You better get on an altar of prayer, and you better get right with God. So we understand that, that how, amen, we react and, and act in a daily life, amen, can dictate our temperance. In other words, if I'm spiritually, super spiritual, and some of you have seen this, this Christian before, she or he is super spiritual. Every time you talk to them, it's, it's a spiritual talk. Everything's all spiritual. And then you get off in another situation and you hear or you see things that's not spiritual. In other words, there's some people that are so heavenly minded, they're no earthly good. Amen. In other words, they talk a good game, but they don't live it. And what is that? That is 
not being temperate in all things. All right, so we're coming to a close. Every man that striveth for the mastery, we want to master. We want to master this run. Amen. How many, how many runs do we get? We get one. How many races do we get? One. Now, we understand when I talk about mastery here, I'm not talking about you'll never make another mistake between here and heaven. But what I'm talking about is that my desire for him, amen, is genuine. I don't have a desire to do those things. And I bring myself, as Paul would say here, he says, I therefore so run. Well, let me finish that. Part. And every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. In other words, he brings everything underneath the desire to obtain. He wants to win this race. So he's got to get his mind in right. He's got to get his stamina right. He's got to get his physique right. Not too many 275-pounders running the 40-yard dash winning the race, I promise you. Amen. So there's a lot of work that's to be done. Amen. My mind might be right. My heart might be good enough. But my rear end ain't going to carry it out. <laughs> Amen. I'm, just, I'm toting too much with me. I, I can't outrun him. So what I'm saying is that I've got to get everything pulled together and know this. I don't know how long I've got to this race is over. But if every day if I'm gaining ground, you know, if I'm going to run the 40-yard dash and I'm going to have to do it against, say, Carl Lewis or somebody like that, Carl, let's don't run next week. Give me a year. In other words, you know, I'm going to push it out. So now understand this. Every day I want it to be further off so I have more time to do what? Get ready to prepare. So now we don't know how much time we have. But what we do know is that the time that we have, let us use it. Paul said to redeem the time for the days are evil. In other words, let's use every moment, amen, to bring everything into subjection, amen, that we can strive for the mastery, amen, and win this incorruptible crown. All right, so he says, we know they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we do it to obtain an incorruptible. This is where he breaks off from talking about the runners in the Greek games, the Olympics is what we would call them today, to talking about the spiritual race. He says, so I therefore run. In other words, he says, I therefore so run. In other words, he says, I want to obtain this incorruptible crown. So he says, I am very much in this race. And he says, that's the reason why I'm running, because I want to obtain that which Christ died to give me. And he says, not as uncertainly. How many of you, now this is where the rubber meets the road. We talk all, a lot of times about a born-again Christian or a head-knowledge Christian. How many of you know the difference? How many of you could explain the difference to the cashier at Harvey's on the third aisle on a Friday? Could you explain the difference to her in the time it takes you to get your groceries checked out from the tens of millions of people that's behind you? Maybe Wednesday. Can you get it explained to her in that amount of time? She's, boy, she's a checking it out. Let me tell you about Jesus. Let me tell you, honey, about being born again. See, there's such a thing as those that know him from a heart, and then there's those that only know him in their head. There are those that are religious, but then there are those who are born again. And see, we have to begin to understand the difference because if we don't, our immaturity will show. Our immaturity will show if we don't grow to where we see the difference. A lot of times, a mature Christian is a quiet Christian when it comes to a lot of conversation that's going on outside the church. Inside the church, we should have a lot to say. Outside the church, a lot of times, the best thing is to not say nothing at all because when we open mouth, a lot of times our immaturity will come out. Quiet in here. I'm not telling you not to talk to people about the Lord. But have you ever been engaged in that conversation? You said, I wish I'd have not said nothing at all. I jumped on that dog before I was ready to hunt with him. I should have kept my mouth shut. Sometimes we go looking to say something. And in that spirit, not necessarily of God, but of self, the devil gets a one over on us. I've caught myself in that situation before. I'm a preacher. I'm going to tell them how it is. And the Lord says, son, you should have been quiet. He said, I could have done a lot more through you. Would you just sit there not saying a thing than 
all those words you use to mess it up. He says, I therefore so run, not as uncertain. In other words, we're running this race not with uncertainty, but with certainty, a surety, steadfastness, solid foundation, born again. Makes all the difference in the world. When you know that you know that you know. When you don't have to lay there and wonder. But you know that you know. Amen. I'm not perfect, but therefore, but for the grace of God, go I. Amen. I'm born again. And like a hard-headed youngin' sometime, he has to get on to me. Amen. But thank God I hear from him. Thank God he gets on to me and lets me know when I ain't right. Amen. And I can get it right. So I'm not uncertain. Paul says we don't run this race in uncertainty. I'm assured I'm going to win. I've got all the confidence in the world. I'm going to win this race. I'm going to finish it. Amen. And the Bible says, Blessed is the man that endureth temptation, for when he is tried, amen, he shall receive a crown of life. That was James, amen. He says we endure that temptation, amen. We endure that struggle, that trouble, amen, whatever that comes against us, amen. Why? Because we're not uncertain in this fight, amen. We're sure and steadfast, amen. We have confidence in God, amen. Whatsoever comes, let it come, amen. I've got what it takes, amen, to finish and win. Amen. I'm not the snotty five-year-old that I used to be. I've grown in the Lord. I'm not the one running around wanting red carpet all the time. I'm not the one all the time wanting to do this, that, or the other. Now, as the pastor, I got some men better to tell you. I, I got some ideas. I got some things I'd like to do. I ain't going to lie to you. I'd like to see this church grow. I'd like to see some things happen here. I'd like to see a sign that we're not stale but that we're doing and, and, and trying to better what God's give us. But we're not going to go out there tomorrow and break the bank doing it. As the Lord blesses, as the Lord helps, as things arise and, and needs arise, amen, we take care of them and we do that which is necessary. God's give us some good people here to help us in that that we're doing. So we have to temper it ourselves. Amen. What is it that you need to bring under subjection? We're certain. He says, so fight I. In other words, he says, I'm fighting this race. I'm fighting in this life. Not as one that beateth the air. How many of you ever, ever seen a shadow boxer? He ain't hit nothing yet. He's tearing that shadow up, though, boy, let me tell you. He says, I'm not out there just throwing punches just wildly. Where's my enemy at? I ain't got a clue. Do you see the difference between a born-again Christian and a head-knowledge Christian? I know you. some of you don't see it yet. He says, I'm running this race with certainty, not uncertainty. The born-again Christian, amen, knows that he or she knows that they know that they know, amen. How do you get through the hell that you're going through? Because greater is he the same than he that's in this world, amen. I don't understand how you've gotten through what you've gotten through. Well, if you had a relationship with Jesus Christ like I do, amen, it's as real as this floor, amen. It's as tangible, amen, as any other relationship. I've, it's more so than anything else I've ever had, amen. He is real in me. Certainty. The head knowledge Christian, got the three-piece suit on, amen, loves the songs, can sing every song, sing every note to Amazing Grace. But they've got a lock on their heart. They won't let him in because they've got to give up too much, because they've got to change too much, and they're just not willing to make that. But see, they can hide that with a three-piece suit. They can hide that with some Dapper Dan, you know, boy, they can slick it down, you know. They can calm it and make it look real good, amen. They can say the right words, amen. They can amen the preacher when he's preaching, amen. But there's no fruit of a born-again life. So, Brother Chris, I, I'm having a hard time seeing what you're seeing. Keep growing. But he says, so fight I not as one that beateth the air. The born-again Christian knows where his or her enemy is. And we put the fist, the sword, the spirit, right where it belongs, right upside his head. And in the name of Jesus, get thee behind me, Satan. He didn't say, Satan, get from my left side to my right side. 
Satan, stay behind me. He says, get thee behind me. You can't have an opposition from the back. You can have a resistance from the back. But you can't have an opposition. And he says he is an oppressor. Amen. He is an opposition against us. And he comes at us from the front. But in the name of Jesus, we have the authority to put him behind us. Where are you aiming at? If you're born again, you know where your enemy is. If you ever watched a boxer, when his enemy was in front of him, he was punching this way. How many fights did he win? He's old and 32. He ain't won one yet. He throwed 100 punches, but he missed them all. That sounds to me like the religious crowd. Oh, they stabbing at things. We feeding this, we clothing that. We put this on this. They'll put lipstick on a monkey, and it's still a monkey with lipstick. Do a lot of things and call it God. Do a lot of things in the name of this, that, and the other. And at the end of the day, where's their enemy at? They don't know. They don't recognize the enemy. I told you I was closing, didn't I? Mm. He says, but I keep under my body and I bring it into subjection. So that there tells you, bringing it underneath subjection. Subjection to what? My will? Uh -uh. I'm not mine anymore. If you're born again, you're not yours anymore. You belong to Him. So I bring it under subjection to the will and the purpose of God because He is who I am looking to. So whenever I bring it underneath him, what is that that I'm bringing in? My thoughts. What kind of thoughts have you had lately? I sure don't like her and the way she's doing so-and-so. If I had half of mine, I'd tell her. She's mistreating her baby, her mama, her granny, her... Well, is that wrong, Brother Chris? It's not wrong to think that they may be doing something wrong, but that ain't where we stop at, is it? We've got to go on with it. This is what I do. And if I get my chance to get a hold of her, I'm going to... That's when we've just went too far. I need to bring it under subjection. Subjection to what? To the will and the purpose of God. What's the will and the purpose of God for her life? That she be born again. How is she going to get born again if you want to fight with her? How is she going to be born again or get born again if you're the only witness that ever comes by her for the testimony of Jesus Christ? And in the five minutes you have to witness to her, you tell her off for how bad of a daughter she's been. Oh, I know that stings. It stings me because I've done it. It's that close, people. It's living it that close. See, it's not living it the way we want to live it and then coming to church and, God, forgive me for it. And then next week, live it like we want to live it and come back in, God, forgive me for it. It's living it that close all the time. Paul said, I got to bring it under subjection. It's not wrong to call things that are wrong, wrong. But when we do so in such an attitude, that does not lift up the Lord Jesus Christ. I'm going to be honest with you. You can draw close to the Lord and live your life in such a way that you can say something to somebody that God gives you to say, and it will cut them like a knife without ever one harsh word ever being uttered, without ever, even one single foul word ever being uttered. But because the Spirit of God is working through what you're saying, through obedience to Him, it will hit the mark, and it'll be effective. Whereas if we step outside, outside of that subjection, we're not temperate. We don't bring it in, but we step outside to give them a piece of that pie. That causes what? Does that cause them to come under conviction to the Lord Jesus Christ? We have to bring it under subjection. I know this is somewhat tough. 
But how many of you want to strive for the mastery of the incorruptible crown? See, we're not going to get there by living the way we want to live and then saying we love God with all of our heart because that's just a religious-minded person. But a person that's born again brings it under subjection. I'm not saying it's easy. I'm not saying you get it right the first time. But what I am saying is that when you fall, you're guilty. You know it. You don't want to do it again. You want to do better. And you pray and you seek God's will. And he lifts you up and he cleans you off. And you go again. And you may do better for a while and you may stumble again. And again, you're guilty and you don't go back and make those same mistakes over. I ain't saying you won't make it twice, but I'm saying after a while you know it's time to grow up. We've got people in the church house that can't talk to one another because of things that's happened. Sons and daughters get married and all of a sudden break the church wide open. And they get a divorce. All of a sudden, this family can't no longer fellowship with this family. Some of you may have been through something like that. Dad tried to pastor a church like that one time. Two of the biggest families there. Most support in the money, most support in the activities. Whatever was being done, they was there. They had the most people on both sides. I mean, it was just a two-family church, basically. And, boy, whenever their two youngers got married and all of a sudden they was trouble, tore it all to pieces. This side didn't like that side. This side didn't have no confidence in this side. They wasn't out there fist fighting. But whenever you walk in the church, it was as cold as ice. They wasn't no fellowship. You know they didn't like each other. I mean, they wasn't fist fighting and, and doing and carrying on like that, but it was, a, it was a coldness that was not of God. They didn't bring that under temperance. See, if those two families could have come and met and said, hey, we got to work through this thing. See, I want to go to heaven when this life is over. And I don't want no aught with you. I don't want nothing to be between me and you. I, I want us to be able to communicate and, and, and love. We may not fellowship no more as far as the way we once did. I may go somewhere else. We, we may not work it out like it once was. But before I go, we're going to make it right with God. And I believe if we'll do that, God will allow us to come together again. So we strive for the mastery. And the question I'm wondering is, do we have the heart to put in the effort it takes to run this race? I believe the born-again Christian, I like that term. Just Y'all just bear with me while I use it every Sunday and Wednesday. Born again, that just, that just says it all to me. I'm not rehabilitated. I'm born again. I'm a new creature in Christ. I can't do and act like God's allowed me to be and act these last years without Him. I know what I was before Him. And it's totally opposite of what it is now. And because of that, I'm working every day. I use that word work. You heard me. I use that word work because it's hard. It is a work to bring these thoughts, anger, jealousy, sometimes a, a, a self-pity, sometimes a, depress, a, a depressive thought, sometimes a, a thought of not uh, being good enough. All these thoughts the enemy brings to us. I mean, it's hard sometimes to preach and know when you walk out that door that you just failed miserably. You, you didn't get it across. And nobody got anything out of it. That's what the devil tells you when you, when you get out of here and go home. He, he tries to jump in that truck and ride with me. So he said, man, they didn't nobody get nothing out of that. He said, you wasted their time. I mean, we, I mean, we, fight, these, we fight these battles. It happens. And, and, but yet, because I'm not what I used to be, I'm able to fight this now. And, you know, it's a maturing process that I want us all to engage in. See, I don't want us to be in this same maturity level next year. I want us to grow. And the number one thing is whenever we can show love to others. When you can show genuine love to others, you've grown. I ain't say you've grown up, but I just said you've grown. And then you've got to have patience allow God to work and in patience he'll yield amen a peaceable fruit 
amen, fruit will begin to abound in your life when you have patience with God. Let God work. Let God do what he's going to do. Amen. Bringing all things under temperance and subjection underneath this body so that I can prepare to run this race. We, we have a responsibility. We have a responsibility in our relationship with God. And I say, I know some believe, you know, hey, Brother Chris, I got saved, and, you know, now I'm just going to leave it into God's hands, whatever happens to me. And they, they live their life with such a uh, carelessness for the things of God. No reverence, no holiness, no righteousness, no thinking about the things of God in such a way as it pertains to their life. Holiness to them is what God is, not what they should attain to. Righteousness is not who they are. It's just who God is. But he says we are the righteousness of Christ, of God through Jesus Christ. So in other words, you, you are holy and righteous, or you should be. I didn't say holier than thou. I said that you should be attaining. There should be an accountability for holiness in your life, righteousness, to live according to the will and the purpose of God. Maturity. Amen. That's what we want to do is mature. Bring it into subjection. What is it that you need to bring into subjection in your life? My wife sent me one of them funny little things. If you've got a smartphone, if you don't have a smartphone, don't get one. <laughs> Just stay away from it. Because once you get one, you won't never, you're just always on it. You know what I'm saying? You ever see them, they just... There's just so much on them things to do. But they got these little things called memes. M-E-M-E, -M -E, memes, or mem, however you want to pronounce it. And it's all these little cute things. It'll be a cute little picture, and it'll have a funny saying on it. And it's usually sarcastic, or it's funny. It may be, you know, some of them's vulgar. You know, there's all, all kind out there. And my wife sent me this little thing, and it showed a, I believe it was a little Yosemite Sam picture. Y'all remember him in, in the Road Runner? And he's the one that always is trying to shoot, shoot everything. And uh, and I had allowed something to get under my skin the other night. Hadn't happened in a while, <laughs> but I'm gonna testify for just a second while I close. But I had allowed something to kind of get under my skin. It wasn't nothing that amounted to a hill of beans. But that devil jumped on me, and I showed my temper for about 30 seconds. I pulled around at a particular restaurant to eat. We eat, and we left. Everything was good. Everything was fine. There was about 5,000 cars in that parking lot, and they had blocked every way to get out. And I said, these aggravating teenagers, if they would learn how to drive. And, boy, it just flew all over me. I throwed that truck in reverse, and I spun them tires, and, boy, rocks went everywhere. Well, when the rocks hit my truck, that really set it off in. Because then I spun them even more. And by the time I got out of there, I'd squalled the tires at the Huddle House parking lot. I was mad as fire. Wasn't so much mad at them as I was mad at myself for getting mad. And then my wife wanted to poke fun at me. Send me one of them little old memes, and she says, it said something about it. It says, so you think that, uh, how did it say it? It says, so you think that, that getting mad, so you think that getting mad is something that you wouldn't ever do? And then that little Yosemite Sam picture pops up, and he's like, bam, 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 bam. And it's like, this is a picture of you. So I need to bring that under subjection. I've done a lot better. I have. I mean, I'm going to give God the glory. I've done a lot better. But I failed him the other night. I didn't say nothing wrong. You know, I didn't verbally attack nobody or do it. But what I did was I allowed the enemy to have that little bit of control. A lot of people wouldn't have thought nothing about it. But because I'm striving for the mastery, for an incorruptible crown, the Spirit convicted me of that said, Son, even though you didn't, nobody else in the world knows what you did, but you and your wife and me, I know. And if you want to make heaven your home, you get it right. It's just that close. We live in it just that close. 
We've got to live it just that close. Are you striving? What is it that you need to bring under subjection to the purpose and the will of God? I love you tonight. I appreciate you.